All right, our subject for today is going to be, will the Jews accept a Gentile Messiah? You see my little drawing here. We'll get to this character here in a minute. But let's start out here in Romans chapter 9. King James Bible, turn to Romans chapter 9. And if you're Jewish and you don't accept the New Testament, you'd still would do well to actually read along, uh, look it up online, or even get a copy of a King James Bible. Pause this and go and actually read it and see what the New Testament says. See if it lines up with the Old Testament. Romans chapter 9, verse 3, and we'll begin there. It says, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. This is Paul writing here. Who's he talking about? Verse 4, Who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? Whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. Now look at this. For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So Abraham had a couple of different children. If you read the Old Testament, you know that. But only those descended from Isaac are those that are of the chosen. They're the chosen Jewish people, the um, children of Israel. So my question Will the Jews accept a Gentile Messiah? The answer is yes and no. You say, huh? What are you talking about? They are not all Israel which are of Israel. If you know anything at all about the nation of Israel, uh, not everybody that lives over there, not everybody that goes with the title Jewish, they're not all Jews. Okay. Now, I do not hold to the Roman Catholic satanic teaching of replacement theology that there are no more Jews, that that whole kindred of people is gone, and that the Christian church has replaced Israel. That is satanic nonsense. I've debunked that thing many times. It's not what the New Testament teaches. Obviously, here in this passage, if the Jews were no more, then why is Paul referring to Jews according to the flesh? Uh, if, if it's just when you see Jew in the New Testament, it's a reference to spiritual Jews or some kind of nonsense, absolute total nonsense. And when I go like this, I'm not trying to be like our uh, little buddy back here. I'm uh, saying in quotations, okay? Can't do it with both hands because this hand's occupied. But there will be people who call themselves Jews that will accept this man that's coming to whom the New Testament identifies as the Antichrist. All right, and he is a real character, and we're going to see that he appear, appears in the Old Testament as well. I saw a uh, rabbi recently, Tovia Singer, and he was saying that there's no mention of an Antichrist in the Old Testament. I thought, well, you are completely ignorant. Uh, yes, there is. And ironically, he said in another video I saw of his, he actually said he believes that the Jews are going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble, and then the Messiah comes. Oh, he's right on that. And you'll see that the Messiah is, in fact, Jesus Christ which I have proved in other studies, and I will continue to prove until the Lord catches me and all the other saved believers out, be they Jew or Gentile. All right, but uh, it's important to remember that the Jews, there will be some who will accept a Gentile Messiah. Now, here's the whole crux of this whole study, okay? What's this study about? Well, there's a lot of brethren that are saying that the uh, Antichrist that's coming has to be Jewish. Otherwise, the Jews would not accept him as their Messiah. Uh, I beg to differ. Um, I was actually looking at this thing, this whole study, and I'm saying, okay, you know, there's a, there's a thing with that the, the Antichrist is going to be a Syrian Jew. We're going to look at that, that evidence today. We're going to look at the scriptures today. We're going to examine things. Okay, because you see, there's a lot of people that are just repeating things. I've done it myself many, many times. For years, I was repeating the thing that the false prophet is the Pope and the Antichrist is a counterfeit for Jesus Christ. Uh, well, the problem with that is that I was teaching that the, that the false prophet shows up first and kind of paves the way for the Antichrist and kind of announces the Antichrist. Uh, that's not what the Bible teaches. Uh, you can look it up. It's plain as day in Revelation chapter 13. In fact, let's go there real quick because I know that there's some naysayers out there that are going to say, that's not what the Bible teaches. Let's, let's actually look it up. 
And don't be narrow-minded and say, oh, I'm not going to look. I don't want to look. Let's look it up. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. It goes on to describe this beast there. Verse 11, jump down to verse 11 in chapter 13. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him. Okay, now I had a, uh, somebody write in the comments, I don't know, brother or sister, I'm not sure which, but they said, see, the, the false prophet, the second beast there, he shows up and he's doing the signs before the first beast. So there's not any kind of interval, it's just, you know, this one shows up, that one shows up at the same basic time. Uh, you're really stretching it there. I mean, come on now. You know, the first beast before him, there's no comma there. All right? It's not uh, that he's doing these signs and wonders before, you know, in front of, in other words, in front of the first beast. I don't believe that way. Okay? He shows up, clearly shows up after the first beast. And if you study the thing out, and we're going to see this, I do believe that what's going to happen is whoever the first beast is, he's going to fulfill a particular role within the Roman Catholic Church, also known as the Pope. Now, it could be that whoever's the ruling Pope at the time could, you know, this man will show up, and all of a sudden it's just like they, the Pope takes off his crown and gives it to the guy. You know, I still do believe that that is probably going to be what happens. Um, I don't know. I think it's going to be a time of chaos after the catching away of the body of Christ. Uh, there's going to be a lot of crazy things going on there. There could be a war that's triggered right around the same time as the rapture. And in, that, in the midst of that, a guy shows up. The Pope, you know, steps down and some new guy stands in. She'll be talking about this. And, you know, he signs the covenant that you read about in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And uh, peace treaty is confirmed, and, and there's your man. And after three and a half years, the false prophet shows up, or some other time. I don't know. I don't know all the details. I'm going to be talking about that, too, as we continue. As far as here, Christians trying to predict what goes on in the time of Jacob's trouble. So there are some issues with that. But we're going to do a detailed study today on this man of sin, the son of perdition, the mystery of iniquity, uh, there's a lot of terms that the New Testament gives him, and he's also in the Old Testament, definitely very clearly uh, as the idle shepherd. Um, and you see him there throughout the book of Daniel as well. This man that's described, a couple different chapters. So for a rabbi to say there's no mention of an Antichrist in the Old Testament uh, shows a def definite uh, prejudice. Okay? A prejudice that's there that trying to lead Jews away from understanding that the New Testament and the Old Testament tie in together. So you do well to open your mind with this study. But now we're going to look at there are types of the Antichrist in the Bible because there are certain things that happen to this Antichrist and all throughout the Old Testament there are different men and New Testament as well. There's a couple. Um, there are men who have similar characteristics and traits types in the Bible, we call them, um, that show you kind of the personality and character of who the Antichrist is going to be. Um, again, you know, if you know your Bible, you know that Jesus Christ at one point said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. It's a great picture of our salvation. Okay, Moses lifted up on a pole, he lifted up the serpent. When they got bit by these poisonous serpents, they looked to the serpent and they were healed. Okay, Jesus became sin on the cross, and uh, he took our sins up upon himself. And therefore, when you look to the cross, the sins, the, the venom of sin, can be uh, healed, can be cured. But now let's look at 18 different types of the Antichrist. All right, we're going to look at these in detail. First of all, we have Cain. All right, and I'm going to read from this book here. This is The Mark of the Beast by Dr. Peter S. Ruckman. It's a very good book on this subject, and uh, you don't have to agree with Dr. Ruckman to see that these types are definitely there. 
I'm going to read these for you. Cain says here, In type the seed of the serpent born of that wicked one who had a mark which signified a murderer. Okay, so you see there, he is born of that wicked one, the Bible talks about, and, um, and he has a mark. God puts a mark upon Cain. So, you have, he is wicked, and marked. There's a mark associated with him. Okay, next we have Nimrod. Who was Nimrod? Well, Nimrod, his name means the rebel, the 13th from Adam, the 13th, interesting, and a builder of an integrated United Nations to glorified man. He is a Hamite whose seed had a divine curse on it, as Cain, Nimrod also has a root derivation of leopard. Again, there's a whole lot of stuff here I can't get into. But the thing is, Nimrod was a mighty hunter. He was the leader of the first city of, of Babylon, the Tower of Babel, that whole story there. So you have Nimrod. He is a, a world... Military leader. Okay, basically the, the head of the very first New World Order. Next we have Pharaoh. Okay, Pharaoh. What's his story? The one who persecuted Israel and is called a dragon in Ezekiel 29, verse 3. Um, and, you know, compare that to Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Plagues come on him as in Revelation, and his catechism is, I know, th uh, I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. So, what's Pharaoh's uh, similarity to the Antichrist? Well, he perse persecuted persecutes the Jews. All right. And of course, if you know the story, a lot of what goes on with Moses in there where he's basically coming in and saying, you know, he's smiting with Pharaoh with all these plagues. A lot of those plagues show up in the book of Revelation. It's actually repeated. And Moses shows up in the book of Revelation as one of the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah. Again, I've done I have a whole, I have an FAQ on that, proving it. Yet, it, yes, it is Moses and Elijah. It is not Enoch. Okay, a very interesting study. It cannot be Enoch. It is Moses and Elijah. Watch my FAQ on that. I'm not going to get into all that study here, but interesting that in the time of Jacob's trouble, Jerusalem is called Sodom and Egypt, and when the Antichrist at the end of the well, basically halfway through the time of Jacob's trouble, when he calls the sacrifice and oblation to cease, the Jews are supposed to flee, get out of Jerusalem. Hmm. Sodom and Egypt? Like with Pharaoh? Very interesting. Next we have Balak. Back in the Old Testament. The man who tries to eliminate Israel winds up corrupting Israel with Baal worship. His prophet is Balaam, thus making a trinity. Father Baal, son Balak, unclean spirit Balaam. And you can see Revelation chapter 16, verse 13, where it talks about this thing of three unclean spirits and things. Baal is our word bull or ox. And uh, Balak is a king as the Antichrist. He is a half-breed of Moabite extraction. The Moabites coming from the mulattoes of Lot's Hamitic wife. So... Lot having a relationship with his one daughter. Um, so, Balak, uh, Baal, he is a Baal worshiping king, like the Antichrist is going to be. Next, we have Sisera. What is Sisera? 
Sisera is a Gentile king who was defeated at Megiddo, which is the Armageddon of Revelation. The stars in their courses fight from heaven against him, and the man who fights him is said to be a type of Jesus Christ. Uh, see Judges 5.12, Ephesians 4.4-10. 4, 4 the way the liberal knocks out Judges 5 is by calling it poetry and then insisting that all poetry is figurative. Yeah, very true. And uh, interestingly, though, Sisera is killed by a blow on the head. Hmm. So, Sisera, you have a king wounded to death, of course, but wounded in the head by a woman. Hmm. Kind of like the uh, Bride of Christ when we come back with the Lord Jesus. Interesting little tie in there. Next we have Abimelech. What is Abimelech? The man is a rebel who was killed by a blow on the head. Another one. I'll just write down he is a rebel. And again, I'll get right up there to that one. Same thing as Sisera. Wounded in the head. Absalom. Next we have, actually I'm, I'm looking at a different list here. Uh, Goliath. We'll go to Goliath next. What's Goliath's story? Tall man, he is killed by a wound in the head. Goliath comes from Hamitic background, exactly as Nimrod, Balak, or Balak and uh, Pharaoh. He has six pieces of armor, and he is killed by David, David being a type of Christ. Interesting. So Goliath is, uh, again, we'll say, uh, let's see, Six pieces of armor and killed by a wound to the head. And he also blasphemes God, just like the Antichrist is going to do. Next we have Saul, King Saul from the Old Testament. This is the kind of thing, by the way, you need to take notes on. Uh, I didn't say with your ebook or with your uh, iPad or whatever else. You know, it's very important. You, a lot of people say, why don't you just do PowerPoint or whatever else? Well, first of all, those things are so problematic. You go in, you, you're doing this thing, and it doesn't line up right and whatever else. And, and not only that, but don't get too technology dependent, okay? It's good to write things down, you know, with your hands, right? Take notes on this type of stuff. I took a lot of notes. I have whole books full, you know, notebook paper full of, of notes from sermons I used to listen to when I first got saved and things. You need to take notes. Very important for you. That's why I'm doing it this way. That's why my wife does studies for women this way. But let's continue. Saul. What about King Saul? Well, he is a devil-possessed rebel against God, a usurper of the priest's office, a popular idol, a hater of David, Again, David being a type of Christ, and he's also a tall man. So uh, I believe that the Antichrist is going to be a tall man as well. But um, so you have King Saul and Priest. I won't uh, mention any names of a certain office that's held by somebody that's both... Uh, spiritual and temporal. You won't get into that right now. How about uh, Nabal? Nabal. Kind of hard to draw on this thing sometimes, but uh, Nabal. Let's see, got to find him here. An enemy of David, David being a type of Christ, and as was Herod, is killed by God. His answer is identical to Pharaoh's, except the word David is inserted for Lord. See 1 Samuel 25, verse 10, and Exodus chapter 5, verse 2. So, again, you have an enemy of David. 
which would be an enemy of Israel. See, you know, the old saying, the only thing that men don't learn from history is that, you know, or the only thing that men learn from history, excuse me, is that men never learn from history. Uh, well, that's very true. That's why the Lord gives types throughout the Old Testament, and even into the New Testament, so that men can remember, oh yeah, this type of thing is there. They can see the character and how it was very negative. And that's why these types are there given for the Antichrist. But let's continue. What about uh, what I have here, where are we at? Absalom. Yeah. Absalom. Let's see. Let me get it here. All right. This father of peace obtains the kingdom peaceably by flatteries. See 2 Samuel chapter 15 verses 2 through 6 and compare it to Daniel chapter 8 verse 25 and chapter 11 verse 24. He rebels against David, a type of Christ. Again, we see that. He is perfect in beauty and is hairy and hangs from a tree, essentially, and has a memorial built to himself. So again, he is a, he, he comes in peaceably. A peaceful peaceful ruler you know kind of like uh, United Nations peacekeeping troops go in and slaughter people next we have Solomon King Solomon well, this one might kind of shock you you might think well Solomon was a great man well at one time he was But outlandish women came in and he married all these different women and they turned away his heart from God. And he ended up as an idol worshiper, worshiping false gods. Got to be real careful about that. What about King Solomon? His number is 666. Interesting. You can read about that in 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 13, talking about how much gold he had. 666 talents, I think it was. And six lions are on six steps on one side and six on the other. His throne, Second Chronicles chapter 9, verses 18 through 19. He is a king over Israel and a type of Christ up to the paragraph mark in Second Chronicles 9, verse 13. But from here on, he changes exactly as the Antichrist changes in the middle of the tribulation to the son of perdition and breaks his covenant with the Jews. Okay? So, Solomon, wise... Powerful, and 666 associated with him. Next we have Jeroboam. I'm going to try to get all this on this chalkboard here. What about Jeroboam? Well, let me find it here. Jeroboam, here, it says here, he is a wicked prince of Israel, Ezekiel chapter 21, verses 25 through 27, who worships Baal with the golden calves, which men are to kiss, uh, 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 25 through 33, Hosea 13, verse 2, 1 Kings 19, verse 18. Uh, do you not sign love and kisses with exes? Interesting thing there. Um, this a lot of the, one of the big points he makes in this book is the thing of words that end in X, because X is going to be some, sort of the sign of the Antichrist. Very interesting. Um, Jeroboam, as the Antichrist, had a bad arm. Uh, note the idol of uh, you can see about that in Zechariah chapter eleven, verses sixteen through seventeen, which we'll be going to here in a little bit. First Kings thirteen, verse four, and uh, Kaiser Bill, Hitler, and Napoleon seem to have picked up the thing accidentally. So, very interesting thing. It gets into a lot of different stuff in this book. But the, the point is there, Jeroboam, uh, you know, worshipped Baal. Another, another king that worshipped Baal. 
and he's associated with a kiss. Very interesting. Okay, another one, Ahab. King Ahab. Got to get all 18 of these things on here. He is a wicked prince of Israel and marries a Phoenician Baal worshiper. 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 31. The first reference there, wicked prince of Israel, is Ezekiel chapter 21, verses 25 through 27. Marries a Phoenician Baal worshiper, 1 Kings 16, 31. He is opposed by the herald of the second advent, Elijah, which Elijah will be coming back, one of the two witnesses. You can read about that in Revelation 11. Ahab has priests who wear vestments and come from the apostate tribe of Dan, who call the priest Father. See Judges 17, verses 1 through 3, uh, 5, verse 5, verse 7 through 13, chapter 18, verse 1, verse 6, uh, verses 14 through 25, 28 through 31, and 2 Kings 10, 22. These, hold, these priests hold services at 11 to 12 on the day of the sun god, Sunday, and worship Baal by penitential acts of self-mutilation, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 17, and 27 through 28. And then he says here, Hello, Rome, how did you get in here? <laughs> Further, they honor the queen of heaven with wafers, Jeremiah chapter 4, 44, verse 14, 19, and 25. And as Phoenicians, they come from Ham, see Genesis 10, 19, Zidon in 1 Kings chapter 16. So again, we see Ahab is a wicked prince of Israel, and his wife is a Phoenician Baal worshiper. And uh, she basically has priests that are called fathers. Hmm. So I'll write uh, priests of Baal called Father. What was that religion, uh, particular religion here in the world today that uh, does the same thing? Baal worship, the worship of Baal, basically is sun god worship. That's why they worship on Sunday. And, you know, in the New Testament, they're worshiping on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. There's no problem there. Uh, but in the time of Jacob's trouble, and it's but it's not required, let me say it that way. You can worship God on any day of the week. It doesn't matter. Um, but in the time of Jacob's trouble, you see the Sabbath day coming back, keeping the Sabbath day. You can read about that in Matthew chapter 24. But Christians are going to go into that time, right? Sure. Uh, wrong. Okay, next we have, where are we at here? Ahab, Sennacherib is next. Let me find it here. Sennacherib. What's his story? He's an enemy of Israel who is struck by the angel of the Lord, as was Herod. See Acts chapter 12, verses 22 through 23, Second Kings chapter 19, verse 16 and 35. He attacks Jerusalem, goes away, and returns, exactly as Titus in AD 70, exactly, exactly as Saul chased David in 1 Samuel 24 and 26, and as the Antichrist will do in Matthew chapter 24, thus giving those in Judea opportunity to flee into the mountains. Matthew 24, verse 16, Psalm 11, verse 1. So, Sennacherib uh, basically... Persecutes oops, persecutes the Jews, exactly as the Antichrist will do. Interesting. How about another one here, Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. He builds an image, Revelation chapter 13 and Daniel chapter 3. Uh, this image is 60 by 6 by 6. Interesting. He persecutes the Jewish remnant, 
using seven as the ratio, Daniel 3.19. There are six instruments of music involved in idol worship, and he and it says six times that he set it up. Okay? He is king of Babylon, and this is the last form of government on the earth at the second coming. Revelation chapter 17, mystery Babylon the Great. Nebuchadnezzar as Pharaoh is called a dragon in Jeremiah 51 verse 34 and Revelation 12 verses 1 through 4. Revelation 12, 1 through 4 talking about Satan, the great dragon. So Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. We're almost done here, so I'm just going to stay down here. That's going to be very significant later, later here. Haman, the book of Esther. We've got three more to do. Haman, and then two more. He is called an adversary, which is the meaning of the word Satan. Esther 7, verse 6. He persecutes the Jews as Pharaoh and in, in the Antichrist, Revelation 12, 17. And hangs as Judas and Absalom did. Esther 7, verse 10. Deuteronomy 21, verse 23. And Galatians 3, 13. You can look up those scripture references for different tie-ins there. So, again, he persecutes the Jews Okay. Next we have Herod. I'm going to have just enough room to write everything out. Herod what is Herod's story? He usurps God's voice and is slain for not giving God the glory. Acts chapter 12, verses 22 through 23, and Revelation 19, verse 20. Very interesting uh, tie-ins here. Um, Revelation 19, verse 20, the Lord gets rid of the Antichrist and the false prophet. But there are different types of, of Herod. There are a couple different types of Herod in the New Testament, but uh, the one that uh, he's talking about here is the one that's in the book of Acts. So, um, Herod is known as a great orator. Okay? And they say it's the voice of, it's not the voice of a man, it's the voice of God, or a God, and God drops him dead for that. There's uh, some another certain individual that uh, does the same thing, which we'll be talking about here in a little bit. Finally, we have Judas Iscariot. Now, this is the one a lot of Bible believers will talk about, and we're going to look at him in a little bit more detail. Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples of Jesus. Okay? And um, I'm just going to say, we're going to go into some of the more of this stuff, so I'm not going to read what uh, Dr. Ruckman has written here, but uh, he is called by Jesus the son of perdition. Okay, there you have the list. 18 right there. 18 men, 16 of which are in the Old Testament, two of which are in the New Testament. All right, so let me ask you a question. For those of you out there that say, well, see, you know, the Bible very clearly is showing that the Antichrist is going to be a Jew. He has to be Jewish. He has to fulfill the prophecies of Jesus Christ. Well, that's a big problem, you see, because Jeconiah sinned. He was a descendant of David. He would have been the Messianic line. He sinned and God cut him off and said, nobody's going to sit. No descendant of Jeconiah is going to sit on the throne of David. And I have a whole study on that. Uh, I can put the link here. And so you have, you say, well, I believe that uh, the Antichrist is going to fulfill the, he's going to be a descendant of David, you know, the, the messianic fulfillment. Can't happen. That can't happen. You say, well, I believe the Bible plain, plainly teaches that the Antichrist is going to be Jewish. Uh, you say, and I know that because of some of the types that are given. Again, I saw that in some of the comments. People were giving some of these types. Well, there's just a problem with that. You say, what's that? Well, let's look about this. These 18 men here are all types of the Antichrist. Correct? We've seen that. They all have things that are similar to the Antichrist. But now let's look about this. Cain. I'll put a star beside their names. Cain. 
not a Jew. He's a Gentile. Nimrod, Gentile. Pharaoh, Gentile. Balak, he's a Moabite, so he's not pure Jewish. He's a little bit Jewish. He's got some of Lot, but, you know, some of Lot's wife, which, you know, she's from Sodom and Gomorrah area. She would have been a Hamite. But we'll just let that one blank as far as marketing it as a Jew or a, a Gentile. Sisera, Gentile. Abimelech, Gentile. Goliath, a Philistine, a Gentile. Sennacherib, Gentile. Nebuchadnezzar, Gentile. Haman, Gentile. So what do we have? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of our 18 are Gentiles. You say, well, the Antichrist has to be a Jew. Really? I don't know about that. I don't know about that. You say, well, the Jews won't accept him if he's not a Jew. Oh, uh, some would. And um, we're going to see about that in this study. Next, let's turn to Zechariah chapter 11. Back to your Old Testament here. Into the Minor Prophets. And by the way, to the uh, Rabbi Tovia singer there that said that there's no mention of an Antichrist in the Old Testament, you need to compare Scripture with Scripture. Actually, you need to get saved because that's why the New Testament doesn't make any sense to you. Uh, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You see, that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, by the way. You need to get saved. Then you'll understand the New Testament. You'll make these tie-ins. No problem. Yes, there is an Antichrist in the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 11, verse 17. It says here, Woe to the idle shepherd. Notice how idle is spelled. I-D-O-L. Idle. Is this man over here, my little crude drawing, is this man an idol? Well, uh, if you see the way people react to him, they treat him as a god. Is he a shepherd? Oh, yeah, yeah. He shepherds a huge flock. The biggest uh, church in the world is run by this guy. You say, what about Islam? Islam is a spin-off of Roman Catholicism. They both venerate Mary. You know, and you can get into the whole study of that thing. A lot of their symbology and everything else, they're both Baal worshippers. They're just both descendants of Baal worship. And the Catholics basically help to, to uh, get Muhammad going for help with the Crusades to go out and wipe out the Jews. Again, there's, been, there's plenty of proof of that. Not for this study, you know, can't get into it. But let's continue reading. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Hmm, interesting because you have all these celebrities now and they do this pose thing like this. And they got their, their right eye is darkened. They're going like that, symbolizing a triangle. A triangle is an occult symbol. But it's very interesting there. You have this one eye being darkened, the right eye being darkened. Also very interesting that in the movie, The Passion of the Christ, the Christ that Mel Gibson, the Roman Catholic Mel Gibson, his Christ had his right eye darkened. His right eye swole shut. Hmm. Where does it say that in the New Testament? I'll give you a hint. It doesn't. Nowhere in the New Testament does it say that Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, when he was beaten and things, Nowhere does it say that his right eye was darkened. Who is Mel Gibson trying to portray? I'll give you time to think about that one. Okay. <laughs> so, you see there that this idle shepherd, his right eye is darkened, and his arm is also, uh, the sword shall be upon his arm, and it, upon his right eye, his arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Okay, now... I believe that. I take that to mean that he's actually going to have a wound to his right arm and also to his eye. All right. And, you know, the sword there, maybe it will be an actual sword. Maybe it's just, you know, sword as in type as a weapon. I don't know. I'm not going to be here to find out. 
and you don't have to be here either, by the way. I'll talk about that later. Next, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 48. Now, here's where the people try to tie this thing in. And, you know, I looked at it. And I'm trying to be fair about this thing and saying, okay, you know, because uh, this, this is the text that they'll take you to, to to prove that the Antichrist is a Syrian Jew. Jeremiah chapter 48, verse 24 and 25. Let's read about it. And upon Kirioth, and upon Bozrah, and upon all the cities of the land of Moab, far or near, the horn is... The horn of Moab is cut off, and his arm is broken, saith the Lord. Now see, they say, see, that lines up perfectly with the Antichrist in Zechariah chapter 11. The idle shepherd, his arm is dried up. This says it's broken, you know. Uh, yeah, so that's that proves it. He's a Moabite. He's from Kiriath, you know, Judas Iscariot, you know, a man of Kiriath is what that means, basically. So he is definitely a Syrian Jew. Uh, I mean, it's, I'm sorry, it's stretching it. It's really, really, really stretching it. And again, why are we assuming that the Jews actually are going to get a perfect counterfeit Messiah? And maybe they will. Maybe they, maybe he will be a Syrian Jew. I don't know. But there are so many clear scriptures that point to it being a man like this, a Pope. There are much clearer scriptures pointing to that than there are to this. And, you know, I believe these arguments that I'm going to be presenting in this study are pointing to a Gentile Pope as the Antichrist, as the man of sin, the son of perdition. All right. And let me just show you here uh, something else. Let's look about this thing of Judas Iscariot. Turn to John chapter 6. There's some very interesting things here. And I mean, a lot of this... I mean, this is going to be a detailed study, yes, but there are areas we could go off in and, and just go in a whole new direction. I'm trying to keep this thing fairly concise. John chapter 6, verse 70 and 71 says, Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Okay? Notice something from our text, verse 70. One of you is a devil. Judas Iscariot was a devil. You say, oh, he was possessed with the devil. It doesn't say that. It says he was a devil. So oh, the devil is trying to influence. No, 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 no. He was a devil. You say, how does that work out? I have no idea. I really don't know. But you see, I believe that there are people that are walking around that aren't people. They're devils. I believe Adolf Hitler was one. I mean, you know, look at some of the newsreels of that guy when he's up there in the eagle's nest there in Bavaria and things like this. He's walking around and he's like this or has his hands behind his back. And you look at his eyes, it's like nobody's home. He's just an empty shell with a devil in there just kind of saying, hey, let's do this and let's do that. You say, oh, that sounds very fanciful. Well, the Bible says about that, back in Revelation chapter 13, that the Antichrist is basically going to be Satan manifest in the flesh. Let me show you another verse that's very interesting. Turn to Acts chapter 1. See, this is the kind of stuff that will get you in trouble with your lost relatives. You start to talk about stuff like this, and they'll go, oh, what do you believe in flying saucers too, and you believe in other conspiracy theories, and uh, you know, there's a lot about the Bible, about this book right here. This book says, The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. There's a lot about this book that's going to make you look foolish. And if you choose to stand by a literal interpretation of this King James Bible, you're going to look weird in the eyes of the world. You might as well just get to the point where you don't even care. You say, you know what, if it's in the book, I believe it. Uh, the old uh, Methodist evangelist, Sam Jones, which he had his issues, but... Uh, he had a guy come up to him the one time and he said, do you really believe the Bible? And Sam Jones said every word of it. And the guy said, you mean to tell me that you believe that, that uh, Jonah was actually swallowed by a whale? And uh, Sam Jones looked at him and he said, if the Bible said that it was Jonah that swallowed the whale, I'd still believe it. Mm -hmm. I don't care what this book says. 
I'll believe it. If you don't, you got a problem. All right, you're the weird one. All right, Acts chapter 1, verse 24. What would happen if a devil died? Let's see about that. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. They're trying to choose their own guy to replace Judas Iscariot. That he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, now look at this, that he might go to his own place. Judas died, but he went to his own place. What was his own place? Weird, huh? Down there. Is it possible that Judas was just uh, using the body of a man? And walking around on the earth, and when that body died, Jesus just kind of stepped out and said, yeah, whatever. And he went back down to the bottomless pit to wait for a future time period when he's going to come back up again. You say, oh, this is crazy. I don't know about this. Turn to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. Here you have uh, these creatures coming up out of the bottomless pit. Look at verse 11. You know, 9, 11, Revelation 9, 11. Nothing to it. Chapter and verse uh, markings were not inspired. Sure. It says here, And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, and in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Now, there's some different theories out there. And again, I cannot be dogmatic. I cannot say that this definitely is the same devil that was on the earth as Judas Iscariot. But uh, pretty good possibility. And I believe that this is the spirit that's going to indwell the Antichrist. I mean, Jesus Christ called Judas Iscariot the son of perdition. Hmm. Very interesting. Now, what is the purpose of the Antichrist? It's also very important. Daniel chapter 8. Go back to Daniel chapter 8. Because again, if, if we're going to be dealing with a, uh, well, the people in the time, if the people in the time are going to be dealing with a Jewish Messiah that appears and he's like the Antichrist and everything. And by the way, you know, you look at some of the Jewish websites and not, you know, Messianic Jews or people that are Jews for Jesus or some kind of deal. No, no, I'm talking Orthodox Jews, you know, actual Jewish websites, and you look at the qualifications for the Messiah that they believe is coming, a lot of those qualifications are going to be met by the Antichrist. That's why I say that some Jews are going to accept him. Some Jews are going to accept the uh, Antichrist, you know, which is going to be basically a Gentile because he's going to fill a lot of the uh, qualifications and things. Some of the Jews will accept him, some won't. But let's, uh, let's read here. Daniel chapter 8, verse 23 through 25 going to see some of the characteristics of the Antichrist. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. Compare that to Revelation chapter 13. The dragon gives him his seat and power and great authority. Lines up perfectly. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Who are the holy people? The Jews. Yeah. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. That's very interesting. And he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. All right. This Antichrist, this man of sin here that's mentioned, this king of fierce countenance is going to be uh, very powerful. He's going to be a world leader, but he's going to be destroyed by Jesus Christ, the Prince of Princes, the King of Kings. Later on in the book of Revelation 19, you read about that. So, but let me ask you a question. All these things that this guy does, this King of Fierce Countenance here, um, how's he going to do that without huge financial backing? I saw, you know, one of you wrote in the comments about how that the Vatican, I think it was like, has 
in their possession right now, something like 60 plus thousand, 62,000, I think it was the number, 62,000 tons, tons, did you get that with a T? Tons of gold. That's some serious money. You know, one of the big things that Hitler needed to come to power and things, he needed a lot of money. That's why he had a lot of financial backing from America. Brown Brothers Harriman, uh, you know, which George Bush Sr.'s father, um, Prescott Sheldon Bush, was associated with Brown Brothers Harriman. Uh, there was a bunch of other ones. Henry Ford uh, was big into financing the Nazis. All these guys that are into replacement theology, they were financing the Nazis. Of course, Pope Pius XII signed a concordat with uh, Franz von Papen. Um, you know, the Vatican was behind World War II. Most of the uh, Nazis, the big Nazi officials, were Roman Catholic, including Adolf Hitler, by the way. You can look it up. Again, that's, that's history. It's documented fact. So what kind of an organization is going to need, be needed to get behind the Antichrist when he shows up? Uh, people that have a lot of money. And people say, well, there are Jews that have a lot of money, the Rothschilds and whatever else. Oh, yeah, but uh, there's going to be a lot of problems with that, which we're going to be talking about as we continue here. But this king of fierce countenance is going to have to have huge financial backing and power backing. I mean, at the very least, if you want to say that the Antichrist is going to be Jewish, um, he's going to have to be pro-Roman Catholic because he could never come to power if he was anti-Catholic. But let's uh, continue here. Da Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Daniel 9, verse 27. It says here, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now that seems like a very difficult thing to understand, but when you compare it with other scriptures, what this is talking about is this Antichrist, when he shows up, he's going to confirm the covenant, a peace treaty there, with Jews and Arabs, basically, there, the seed of Abraham, uh, the Isaac versus Ishmael, and Abraham also had other sons too, by the way, um, but he's going to confirm that covenant between them. Seems to me I remember somebody was trying to do that here not too long ago. Oh, that's right, it was the Pope. Uh, Pope Francis actually went over there. And, uh, well, actually, no, I think it was actually in the Vatican area. I have a video on it. Again, I want to put the link to it here. You can watch it. If you click on it, it'll pause this video, and you'll go over to that one and watch it quick. And you'll see the proof that, yes, in fact, the Pope met with the leaders of both the Palestinian state and Israel. He's already trying to get them together. And it's interesting, too, that they met in a garden, and the garden was a pyramid, and at the very top, the capstone of the pyramid, the Pope sit in the middle, and the two men on either side of him. Hmm. But there's no connection to the Pope. It's going to be a Jewish Messiah that shows up. I don't think so. I don't think so. And in that same video, I also have a rabbi here. The name of the video is called Traitor Rabbi Accepts Catholic Knighthood. And my computer over here. And the name of the rabbi is Arthur Schneier. Arthur Schneier um, officially becomes a Catholic knight. Accepted Catholic knighthood. So you say, well, the Jewish rabbis would never stand for a Gentile Messiah. Oh, I think a lot of them will. I think a lot of them have already bowed down to the Vatican. Probably some are Jesuit trained. If not, you know, the ones that aren't Jesuit trained have probably sold out to the Jesuits a long time ago. You know, standing against the evil forces of this world is pretty much impossible unless you're saved. Okay? You try to do it in your own power or with, you know, law firm here or this or patriot organization or blah, blah, blah. It's useless. You don't stand a chance going against this Vatican cartel. You know, you don't stand a chance going against them unless you are saved. All right? So that's very, very important. Now, turn to Revelation chapter 13. I'm going to show you another reason why I do not believe that the Antichrist is going to be Jewish. And I'm not going to be super duper dogmatic on this. I'm not going to say definitely not. He can't be whatever else. 
Let's look about this. Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 5 says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. You know the dragon, being Satan here, has a seat someplace that he sits at? Isn't it interesting that the Vatican is uh, working with Jerusalem to get a throne built there? Interesting. Verse 3, And I saw one of his wounds, or one of his heads as it, were, as it were wounded to death, excuse me, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. What did we read about the idle shepherd? Right eye is darkened, so it's his left eye. Hmm. Verse 4, And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, in other words, Satan, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. God has this whole thing planned out. You say, well, why would God allow righteous people or whatever to go into this thing? Oh, righteous people aren't going to be going into it. The righteous leave before the Antichrist is revealed. We're going to see about that in just a little bit. But uh, for those people that go into the time of Jacob's trouble, uh, God still can get you out of that thing if you rely on the Lord. But you see, again here, people worship this guy. They're going to worship this first beast. That you compare all the scriptures together. You go back to Daniel go back to Zechariah chapter 11, you go, you compare all this stuff together, it lines up. It's talking about the same individual. This man who is typified 18 different times throughout the Old and New Testament. Hmm. Very interesting. But uh, let me ask you a question. For those of you out there that just say, he's got to be a Jew. He has to be a Jew. This Antichrist has to be a Jew. Um, do you think the whole world's going to worship a Jew? I can tell you right now, the spirit of anti-Semitism is rising like a rocket headed for the moon. I mean, it's just like, it's going up. I battle with it all the time. People hate the Jews, turning against the Jews. But there's going to be a Jew that the whole world's going to worship. You say, you know, and, and I there again, I've taught many different times that if a man shows up that's, you know, looks like Jesus Christ, but then a lot of the Jews aren't going to, you know, worship the guy. Now, could it still happen that way? I, you know, possibly, I don't know. We'll get back to that in a little bit. Another question I have for those out there that, that insist that the Antichrist must be Jewish. He just is going to have to be a Jew because we know he's going to be a counterfeit of Jesus Christ and everything else. Another question I have for you on that. Turn back in your Bible to Daniel chapter 2. There's another prophecy which ties into this identity of this man. And I don't think that there's probably hasn't it's probably one of the most uh, written about subjects and guest things and people wondering about one way or the other, you know, who's the Antichrist going to be, you know, is he alive and whatever else. It's a hotly debated subject. But let's read here Daniel chapter 2, verse starting in verse 26. Okay, King Nebuchadnezzar has this dream and he's going to kill all the magicians and, you know, astrologers and all the other guys and uh, Daniel says hey you know let me just check into this thing here I'll pray about it and he comes back and he says okay king this is what it means Jan Daniel chapter 2 verse 26 the king answered and said to Daniel whose name was Belteshazzar art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said the secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men the astrologers the magicians the soothsayers show unto the king but there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What, shall, what should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, the secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king. 
and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Now look at this. Here's where it gets interesting. Verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form of, uh, thereof was terrible. The, this image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out with, with or yeah, cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the, the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. Lowercase k, by the way. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And, who, and, excuse me, and wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. So don't tell me it's some kind of a... In the latter days, this whole thing will show up or whatever. No, it starts out. There are five new world orders. It starts out there with Nebuchadnezzar. He is the head of gold. Verse 39. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the toes of the feet were part of, of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Okay, let me just stop there for a minute. Let me draw this, or attempt to draw it. Okay, here you have, I'll just draw this way. Okay. I'm going to draw this statue here. 